Uh, hello, everyone. We, we'd like to welcome you here to, thank you. and thank you, of course. Thank you and welcome. Thanks for being here at our sort of the second oral history program that we've done in our, in our new series at, here at the Rogers Memorial Library. Um, we are delighted to have with us today a woman who has been a, a longtime Southampton resident who I met, I think, in the mid-1990s when we did several oral history programs about World War II. Mary Shader was born uh, Mary Nardi in Manhattan. She grew up in Yonkers. She went to work for the Board of Education and learned how to work a switchboard. You can correct me later. <laughs> well, you can correct me now. <laughs> I was 17 and volunteered. Oh, volunteered. Saturdays. Okay. Okay. Switchboard. Okay. Okay. Well, so that was ended up being a good skill to have learned. We'll, we'll find out. We'll find out more. Professional volunteer. <laughs> she joined the Women's Ar Army Corps, known as the WAX, on December 7th, 1943 and was in the Army for two and a half years. After the war, she married Charles Shader, who was also from Yonkers, and together with her brother, Robert Nardi, the father of young Robert Nardi, who's here in our audience today, and his wife, they moved to Sag Harbor, and then later relocated in Watermill, in a home that she has lived in for, I think, about 40 years. Is, is that correct? Yeah, but we're not counting. We're not counting, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Somewhat under 40 years. The Schneiders had two children, both girls, Kathy, who lives in New Hampshire, and Susan, who lives next door. After the children were older, Mary went to work for our wonderful friend, Malcolm Terry, the late Malcolm Terry, who was on the Rogers Memorial Library Board for 19 years. And Mary credits Mr. Terry for introducing her to some of his hobbies, including astronomy, she has a large telescope in her living room, and coin collecting. Mary's husband passed away in 1990, and she continues to lead a full and very active life. She volunteers at the Parish Art Museum, at the Rogers Memorial Library, and spends every Wednesday volunteering at Human Resources. She is an exceptional woman, and we are very, very pleased to have her with us today. Please welcome Mary Narnie Shader. We'd like to keep this fairly informal, so if you have a question, you can, you can raise your hand, and we may or may not acknowledge you. But um, I'd like to begin today's conversation by asking you, Mary, generally, if you want to comment on how much awareness you or others around you had of Hitler's movements in Europe in the late 1930s. Well, I think everyone was very much aware of what was going on. But we had a very strong group of America First. In fact, where I worked at the World Book Company, we had uh, one of the presidents of the first. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, they were dead set against going into war. And uh, I think that's what, that and the media helped keep us out for a while. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned to me earlier that a friend of yours was in Europe. Can you tell us about that? Oh, and yeah. Um, Barbara Mann, one of the wax I served with, when she was a teenager, she went to Berlin with her father, who was a businessman. And this was in the early 30s, you know, I'm going way back. Mm -hmm. And marching in the street were these men in brown shirts. And I, I think that's what they were called, brown shirts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, she felt that uh, something was going on over there. And of course, she told me, I felt that we should be over there. Mm -hmm. But not too many people wanted to go to war at that time. Right. Were you aware at all of any Nazi activities on Long Island, or no. was there any feeling of fear no. about no. no, no, never. I wouldn't imagine it would have been an easy time to be of German descent. 
Probably not, because when my mother's family came over, they had to change their name. They were Dutch, and they came over before the Revolutionary War, and their name was Von Acker. And at World War I, they changed, they dropped the Von. Of course, they thought they were German, mm -hmm. and of course, they were Dutch. Right. But I can understand how people castigated them for being German. Mm -hmm. it was, it's, it's natural. Yes, I'm sure, I'm sure it was. Um, it was. Um, Mary, can you tell us, um, do you remember the day Pearl Harbor was attacked? Oh, yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about that I day? I was you? doing. Okay. I was lying on the, on the floor in the living room reading the funnies. We call them funnies in those days, not comics. Right? Yes. yes. I was reading the funnies and heard about Pearl Harbor. I was an air raid warden at the time, and then I sold bonds in the Strand Theater in the office. I was very political. Mm -hmm. I still am. Mm -hmm. And I knew pretty much what was going on. Who was around you? Was your family at home at that time? Oh, yeah. And what was the general feeling? I mean, did you all... Were you shocked? Were you... My brother was in college at the time. He was in Springfield and uh, finally drafted. I wanted him to leave college and, you know, enlist. Get out there and fight. But, you know, he was smarter than I. But um, most people didn't want to go to war. They really didn't. But was Pearl Harbor a turning point? Because then, oh yes, well, yeah, obviously, oh, yeah, just people like enlisted. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when we were talking to some nurses who were in World War II, the, the learning that an incredibly high percentage of, of nurses volunteered for service during World War II, like forty percent, or. In other words, almost one out of every two nurses in the U.S. Yeah, right. volunteered to to serve. And we had a lot of Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to mention my mother. My mother was... She maybe was the one in Normandy that gave us hot coffee and donuts. Yeah. Don't know. Don't know. Mm -hmm. Actually, my parents met in, during World War II because my father was a, was a surgeon in the Army and my mom was a, a Red Cross worker. And... I, just, I think I'll just add my little coincidental story about World War II, which was that when we were looking to do an oral history program about the about nurses in World War II, I found a nurse in Sag Harbor who agreed to meet me at the VFW. And so we met, and I was asking her about her experiences during World War II as a, as a nurse. Well, she worked in the OR in the American hospital in Paris that my father worked in. And so we, we just realized at this meeting of ours that she had known my father. My father was originally from the Bronx. After the war, my father and my, and my mother moved out here to Southampton. And on his first day walking into the OR, who should he meet but this, but the same nurse? So there were many, many coincidences that we learned. But this, was, this was amazing to me. So... Um, The level of patriotism after Pearl Harbor was found was well, it was different. It was it was just. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Because I'm not sure those of us who were born, you know, after the war started, have really had experienced that type of thing. Well, I think that you know when you have a big bombing of a place like that, it makes a difference in people's minds mm -hmm. and. Um, my cousin joined the wax, the waves, and I joined the wax. And all around me in the neighborhood, there was no one young left. I mean, we all joined up, you know. One way or the other, some were drafted too, you know. But one way or the other, we were doing what we called our bit. And to release a man for service, but I never was really, I never released a man. I always had a man for service. Mm -hmm. It was one of those strange coincidences, you know. Yeah. But, I enjoyed being in the service, and I really found a home there. Yeah. I read that a couple places. You have a home. Oh, yeah. I, I, I love it. You seem to be really... I love it. I love being told when to get up. Right. <laughs> when to get up and when to eat. And I really did. I even went out to stand reveling. I didn't have to. <laughs> so you were... No. You I were, found a home in Tuber. You were a Tuber. 
But just to get back to the time around Pearl Harbor, you know, did people talk of nothing else after that? I mean, did people go to work the next day? Well, what, 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 what's that? No, I don't recall it. I think that the people were, I'll tell you one thing, where I work, nobody talked about American Press anymore. Yes, okay. <laughs> there was no longer any talk about it. Now, of course, you were a boss who was in charge of life. You were of the generation who were going off to serve in some capacity, and of course everyone did their part, but it must have been very difficult for the parents, the mothers, the parents of, of everyone who was going off. Oh, my mother went to the army, people in Yonkers, and told them they had some nerve taking her daughter in. And I was down in Fort Oglethorpe, and I got called in before the commanding officer. Really? Oh, yeah. I'm scared to death. They had had a visit from your mom. They had a visit from my mother. My father was very much in favor of it. He thought it was wonderful. I'm very proud of it. But my mother, boom, she well, was very against that. I'm sure that you can understand that a little bit better now. I mean, obviously. Oh, no. If my daughters were to join up, I'd be very proud of it. Of course you would be proud. Yeah. But it would also be a huge worry and, oh, yeah. and sadness for people's sons. But you can worry crossing the street. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Um, Mary, can you just tell us a little tiny bit about the wax when they were founded and, and some of the general jobs? Before we get into your jobs and your experiences, tell us a little bit about the wax for those of us who want to learn a little bit more. Well, I always thought the army was pretty stupid because my girlfriend, she played the cello in the symphony orchestra in New York and spoke fluent German and fluent French. She landed the CBI. And which, I, was, which was what? Oh, I'm sorry, but China, Burma, India. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was kind of a place for young girls to be when you, she spoke German. And, but I volunteered, as I mentioned before, uh, switchboard, so they put me in switchboard. And I enjoyed it. But when I was in basic training, I went into basic training with a, a contingent from New York. And they were dancers, mostly. I was sort of just shoved in with them. And these girls could lift their legs up to the top. <laughs> oh, I made up my mind then that I was going to be physically active. And one day I was out on the field and I saw these girls marching. I don't think there was a girl there under five foot nine. They were the tallest women I had ever seen and they had feet like this. <laughs> because when I went into the army, I took a size four and a half. Came out with a six. You mean feet or dress? Feet. Oh, feet. Okay. They gave me size six shoes, and that's what you wore, so my feet became size six. But these girls had feet, I swear, they, they, they gave them men's shoes. They were all from Texas, and I think it was because of all the beef they ate. I really do. I think it was, you know, the red meat. But they were the tallest girls I ever saw, and one of them became my friend all through the army until she died. But anyway, these girls from Texas and the New York contingent every day went out to march. We did a lot of marching, we did a lot of PT, and uh, how long was your training? Not long, just a few months, and uh, I was sent to uh, an air base. Okay. So, now, Mary, did you mention to me that you volunteered to go, you had to sort of almost fight to go over Six these? times, I see, listen to this. But six times she six registered times. to go overseas. Oh, yeah. They, they was, I didn't know at the time, but they were saving 13 of us for a special job. Like that's what I got the commendation for. Um, we were all telephone operators. And we went in right after D-Day. In fact, D-Day was June 6th and the 11th. I was in New York walking down Fifth Avenue and bumped into my cousin Margie and my cousin Helen. Oh, I was horrified. Because <laughs> nobody was supposed to know I was in New York. I was being shipped out the next day, or two days later. And sure enough, I had to go back to my WAC officer and explain that I just saw my cousins. Out of New York City and six million people. You know, that's, it's rare. It's rare. And that's what happened, right, Helen? <laughs> and anyway, uh, so you we're in New York, ready to get shipped out, and how did you, did you get on a, on a troop ship, or what was it? No, I was flown. Oh, you were flown. I told you, we were very special. Right. <laughs> we 13 girls were very special. We were on a plane. In fact, my sister saw us take off. 
well, not literally taped off, but she saw us get on in a newsreel. Okay. I've never seen it. But she saw it. We got on the plane, and there were 13 girls, pilot, co-pilot, and one man were down in the cigarette. And he slipped most of the way across. But when the co-pilot came back to sit with these 13 beautiful women, I sat up in the co-pilot seat, and we landed at Newfoundland. I can still remember that curve coming into Newfoundland. And we had dinner there. The Army never paid me for it. I had <laughs> 50 cents, of course. But, and I had cut orders from the Army giving me back the money. But who was going to give it back to me? Of course, nobody I ever back. But anyway, uh, I got it back on the plane, and the co-pilot again went back with the girl. So I flew the Atlantic in the co-pilot seat. Oh, oh my about goodness. That. Was that your first flight, Mary? No. I had flown in a Piper Cub in the office, uh, down at the Fort Bingo on the airbase. Okay. okay. All right. So you went overseas, and where did you land? Where were you first? I landed at Air Scotland, right. where my sister had landed when she was 10 years old. Yeah. Isn't that a coincidence? Mm -hmm. Yes, it well, is. She landed by ship. Um, now, what was she? What was your sister doing? She was just on a trip. Okay. And uh, the next, I was. Oh, I must tell you this. It was 11 o'clock at night, and that was bed check. You know, it was dark. We had these big, huge blackout curtains. So I wanted to see the stars, you know, the stars. Pull back the curtains and it's broad daylight. Broad daylight. 11 o'clock at night. They were on double daylight saving time. But even then, we were so far north because we were in Scotland that it was more daylight there in the night time. I'll never forget that. Looking out at water and the fence and the sun shining. Amazing. Amazing. And then, did you, how long did you stay in Scotland? Uh, I think we were there three days, and then they flew us to London. Okay. Uh, that, that's right. The first night I was in London, uh, you know, I volunteered. Mm -hmm. I volunteered to be fire guard up at the top floor. It was the third floor. I wasn't on the roof, but you, there's a flight of stairs, and I sat up there in case of bomb. Well, no bombs had fallen, you know, after a um, 1940, and the bombs had fallen in London. There wasn't too much bombing activity going on. But the Germans were getting ready to put over buzz bombs. Now, that was a flying cross. It was a, a black fuselage with a, the wings, and it had so much fuel that it reached its destination, and when the motor shut off, it dropped, and that was the bomb. So that night, the buzz bombs came over. We didn't know what they were. They just had this funny sound, and then they, ex and then you hear silence, and then a bomb went off. Well, I was all alone. First thing you know, one of my friends came up and sat with me because you're on two, two hour duty, but I was all night. One of the girls came up and sat with me, and then Mary Lou came up and said, there were three of us all night long, and I think all night long I did this. I think I lost eight pounds. Oh, yes. <laughs> I never so we didn't know what it was. We found out you know, later that they were buzz bombs that came from Holland. I forget the town. But anyway, the Americans took care of that. So they were directed at precise targets. I think they were mostly aimed at the east end of London, you know, where the poor people lived. Mm -hmm. They never seemed to hit the um, posh places. Mm -hmm. They seemed to hit the along the river. How close did they come to you, Mary? They knocked out our missile. But I was, I was never bombed. Right. But I saw them in the daytime and I saw them at night. They were quite, quite beautiful because you just visualize a black cross going through the sky with this long, long, maybe a nine foot tail of, I don't know what you'd call it, bright light. It was the uh, fuel. It was very pretty if it hadn't been so obscene. You could see it at night easier than in the day? Then? Oh, yeah, daytime, nighttime. I saw an RAF pilot chasing one of them. He didn't know what it was any more than we did. Yeah. How long were you in London? I think I was there about a month. Mm -hmm. 
there. See, I had access to the switchboard, because I was on, so I could call anybody. I probably could have even called home. <laughs> but I called my brother, and he was stationed in, uh, in London. Was he in Spain? What, what did you? My brother. OK, your brother was stationed in London. Yes, okay. he was stationed in London. So we got to see each other. And when I was um, a civilian, I went to the top of the Empire State Building one time. I'd never been there. And I met an Australian navigator. He was with the RAAF. And we became very friendly, and we wrote to each other. And I saw him in England. I called him. And we went out many times. He died over Acus of Malbus, which was an airfield in London, on a flight coming back from Europe. But my brother uh, and I saw each other quite a bit. In fact, we got bicycles, and that's where I learned to ride a bicycle with a brake on the oh, handlebars. Right. You know, our brakes used to be <laughs> down below. Now, Mary, isn't there a, a picture there with you and your brother in it? That's in Paris. Oh, okay, that's later. In Paris. Okay. What were your accommodations, living accommodations, like in, in London? Oh, in London, we lived in a posh area. We lived on the corner of uh, Weymouth Street and Portland Place. And my son-in-law, many, many years later, was going to England and France one week out of every month. So I said, well, when you're in London, why don't you go look up my old villa? And I gave him the address, and he went. He said, you know, Mary, it's not going to be there. It's, you know, 60 years you're talking about. It's the Portuguese embassy. <laughs> <laughs> With a really beautiful building. And, and out of all that time, only one girl went home. And, you know, nervous. She used to sleep with her helmet and take a bath. But, well, no, we didn't have baths, unfortunately, and I'm a bath person. We had to take showers. That was another thing. You go into the army and you see all these naked bodies. Right. It was horrifying. I, I went back and I said, I'm not going to take any shower. I think it was three days. You mean I naked did. men and women? No, no, no. no. Just like, oh. Just <laughs> like, it was just funny, you know, you see them get fat and short and tall and get you know. <laughs> It's just something you weren't used to. Oh, but Mary, you, you did bring your underwear, didn't you? Oh, yeah, oh. Here, show us. It was very sexy. Oh, oh. This was my, this is silk. Of course, this is before oh, nylon. Oh, no, that's nice. Actually, that's for her. It is, like a dress. I brought my underwear, too, but you don't want to see that. Uh, oh, that's pretty cool. It didn't scrim on. Quality, okay. No. <laughs> but, no, but, oh, this is mine. In the winter time, you got this. But it kept this warm when we were in tents. And there is a person who can say that she still fits into her old clothes. Your old clothes, you still fit into them. I was 103. Well, I, I put weight on. I was 103 when I joined the service. But my physical, what a physical. Oh, I'll never forget that. I went from doctor to doctor to doctor. I must have gone through 20 doctors because it was, you know, like a routine. Uh, the doctor said, you only weigh 130, but you can't be less than 107. So when I was 107, I was, that's what I went in the army at. <laughs> So you had to size six bit. shoes. <laughs> I still take a six. <laughs> um, after you, oh, can you talk a little bit about the OSS? Well, that was much, much later. Let me tell you about how we lived okay. in tents. Okay. We lived in. Now, where, where was this? In Normandy. Okay. At, well, let's. Okay, you were in London. You stayed there a month. I crossed. I crossed the. Oh, we were. Uh, we were sent across, D-Day was, I told you, June 6th, right. right over on the 11th, and I think it was August 30th, I crossed the channel. We slept in a, a swimming pool on the Clannaby Castle, but, you know, no more, there was no water in it, but that's where we slept, and they gave us sleeping pills. Sleeping pills? Yeah, because seasickness, you know, Oh, so we could sleep. Okay. Crossing the channel. The channel is supposed to be very, very rough. I don't know. I was asleep. <laughs> but <laughs> when I crossed the channel and got to Normandy, the first thing I saw was a blue thing in the water. And I hollered out to one of the 
Australians who had this. That was the boat we were on. And it was, they took a big grappling hook and pulled out the body. I don't know what, I don't know whether he was English or American or what it was, but that was my first introduction to death in the Army. But we, when we landed on Utah, there were two places to land, Omaha and Utah. Everything had American names. Yes. Everything had American names. So I landed on Utah and we slept on the beach for two nights. And of course we needed a latrine. So there was GIs camped near us and they built a nice big trench for us and all you did was straddle the trench. It was great. We had all the facilities of home. <laughs> so two, I think it was two days later. Yeah, two days we were there and then we uh, went into Paris. And that was September 4th, Labor Day. Don't forget it. And I remember on the, this big, big, big six by six truck, we drove for hours, because I don't think they went over 30 miles an hour. And I had to go to the bathroom. There. So I took my helmet, and I used my helmet. Before you know it, everybody had their helmets out. <laughs> they wanted to hold on to their helmets, so they didn't put yours out by the It was a good thing we had helmets. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have, I don't know what we would have done. But I found that the uh, facilities, let's call it facilities in Europe, in France, were very, very sophisticated and very primitive. Very primitive. It, it could be so primitive that it was just a pipe in the ground, mm -hmm. about that big, you know? And you just straddled it. Right. And the building that I worked in, if you had, I mean, that was for 14 months I worked in there, that building. If you had to go to the bathroom, you had to go in and you had to stand and put your feet like this and quickly pull this huge chain and jump back fast because the water came up and soaked the shoes. Oh, okay. so that's pretty primitive. Yeah. Yeah. And this was Paris military. This, yeah. was, this had about 250 civilian heroes. Yeah. Of course, I don't know whether the French area was like that or not because I was never in it except on sick wall. But <laughs> Mary, what about B days? Have you ever seen a B day? No, oh, that was when I got to the hotel. There was a bidet. Who knew what a bidet was? I had one now in my bathroom, but I didn't then. I didn't know what it was. So Mary Lou and I used we shared a room. We used to keep our underwear soaking in it or a hosiery. And the French woman that would come in and cleaned, you know. She was horrified. Couldn't speak English at all. She, oh, 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 no, 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 no. And when we bought flowers, there were a lot of flowers in France, a lot of flowers. Every street corner. Perfume, a bar, and flowers. And we used to put the flowers in the bidet. And we didn't know what it was for. Right. Found out, you know, months later. But it was very, very strange. When we slept on biscuits, you know what a biscuit is? No. no. A biscuit is about that thick and about that long and about the same width. And I had three of them on my bed. Was it a sort of a mattress? Or sort of a oh, it was on mattress. Was it mattress? It was filled with straw. Oh. And, and everybody was so proud that we had these things. Were they American made? I mean, were they? I have no idea. Did you have army blankets that you sold? Oh, yes, we had army blankets. We were issued those, and we had to take care of them. We had to take care of everything that was issued to us. Now, what were you doing in France? What was your job? When I was in Normandy, they put us in tents, and we had switchboards. And that's where I met Red Astaire and Ben Crosby. <laughs> But this came into, and uh, they were there for a, a US kind of the USO program. But of course, I was working. I was always working when something important was going on. So Fred Astaire found out about it. He was very totally likable. He found out that there were people working, and so he decided to come and visit us. Then Crosby, he was very back office, maybe. Maybe shy, I don't know. I found out later he would only associate with officers, and of course we would enlisted people. But Fred Astaire came, and in fact he signed my short snorter, my English pound note. I got this when I crossed the Atlantic. You get a short snorter, the pilot of the ship gets it, 
out of the vehicle and he takes a dollar from you. It's a, it's a way of getting money out of you. And, and he puts New York to Scotland and the date and he signed it. And then after that, every place I went, I added I another never, town. I never knew of that. Curtis there signed it. It's on the pound. Here it is. Oh my goodness, what a flourish. Oh yeah, it's a signature. Well, very nice. He stayed with me for about an hour. Really? In big place we left. And Fred Astaire came, sat with me, and he talked to all the people that, when I got somebody on the line, I'd say, Fred Astaire is here. Well, you know, they didn't believe me. So he'd get on and he'd talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> that was very exciting. Yeah, was really we exciting. were very cold here, yeah, very cold. France in the summertime is not warm. Neither is the American South. But the, one of the uh, British boys that I knew said, get newspapers. So I gathered all the newspapers I could find. People would discard them in these big containers, and I'd grab them, and I'd put them under my blanket. And you know, it works. It was like insulation. Yeah. And I felt like that thick. Right. It was wonderful. But I developed chill blanks in my feet, and I still have problems. Oh, my goodness. Well, the black officer that I had got trench foot. Really? So I was lucky. I was lucky. But when the, I went on sick call, they gave me ultraviolet ray treatments. Oh. It didn't work. Right. <laughs> Mary, did you have time off? I mean, what was your, what was your life like? Did you have a, did, were you on call all the time? Did you work hours? No. Or? Every time I had time off, in London, I walked. I walked. We weren't allowed to go more than 25 miles because uh, in case we were, you know, hurt. Okay. That was a euphemism for being, you know, killed. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they didn't want anything to happen to us. And we, so we always wore our dog chains. Okay. Um, you walked and you just, you, you just explored around London and... Yes. I, I, one day I walked for, I swear, I walked four or five miles and it was just level. Just some level along the river where grass had grown up. Mm -hmm. And the only thing standing was occasionally a uh, chimney. So you saw a lot of farmed out areas. Oh, yeah. What about the people? Did you get to know English people? And oh, they're the greatest. I found them to be wonderful. One of them brought me a piece of cheese. I'll never forget that. She, this British girl was sitting next to me on the switchboard. Because we were mixed. The British and Americans were mixed. And she said, what do you miss most from home? And I said, a piece of cheese. Yeah. I don't know, about three or four days later, she brought me in a piece of cheese about that big. <laughs> oh, you know, she took it from her. Her ration. Her ration. Her ration yeah. The English had very bad food. They didn't have, to, they didn't have you know, being bombed. From 1940 on, they didn't have much. But what they had, they shared with us, and we had a lot of Brussels sprouts and a lot of cabbage. Oh. And to this day, I'm not too fond of either. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, but just, and our American food, believe me, was not good. It's not good. You know, because they had to buy in the British economy. They, I don't know if they ever shipped anything in. Did you have K rations or what? Oh, I had K rations and C rations in Normandy. C rations are a little better. The K rations are they're not, they're not good. When I got to Paris, we had a GI who was in charge of the mess hall, and I swear he was a part mafia. <laughs> he must have had he must have had a, an association with somebody in the black market, because our food, we had steak. <laughs> I mean, who had steak in the right. army? We did. But no one complained. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> we, our meals, we had the most wonderful meals that I didn't even my hotel. My girlfriend, I told you, was from Texas. And being from Texas, I hate to say this in front of black people, but Texans did not like black people. And she refused to eat in our hotel because the black contingent there, you know, the army was segregated in those days. Yeah. It was terrible. Never believed in that. But these black girls 
were in the postal group, and they ate in our hotel. The hotel was the Cap Hotel California on the Route of Berry, right across from the Herald Tribune building. Anyway, Mary Lou refused to eat breakfast. That went on for days. And finally, I said, well, you know, you're being a little ridiculous. But finally, she did. She came in, and she found out that she was a little bit ridiculous. Well, I'm glad that that was pointed out to her. But of course, that was the way things were, wasn't it? That's and the way it was. And there was no changing it. And even the, the black men who were in the service, they were all the engineers. And at that time, they found out I could type. So I hardly ever was on the switchboard. I was always typing up rosters or doing something like that, which helped me because that got my stripes. Right. Yeah, yeah tell us, Mary, show us a couple of your uh, well, this, awards. This is what I, I started out with. I was in the third Air Force. I forget about two people back here. Oh, right. And then they took me out. And put me, oh, we were horrified to take out of the Air Force. You know, we thought we were the, you know, pretty, pretty hot stuff. Right. And then they put me in this. But, how about this? Well, that was well, we'll do that later. How about, let's show this. Want to show this? These, yes. These are um, shrapnel. Hold it up. Uh, what's that? Came from, when the bomb dropped, um, of course, if you didn't die, and you got hit with, Shrapnel, you, you had a helmet on to protect your top of your head. I don't know what would protect the rest of you, but they had pieces of iron. This is what was in, and I took this from a buzz bomb that landed on our uh, mess hall. Our mess hall wasn't too far away either. Right. Was this plentiful? I mean, did you find this? Uh, did many people find shrapnel all over the place? No, I think, I think that if someone were interested in a bomb that had dropped in their area, they could go and I was, I was interested because it was my mental. Right? Now, if someone ends up with shrapnel in their leg, which I, you know, you read about all that, would it be this big? These, these are big pieces, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Well, I somehow I, always I, thought I, of little pieces. I think you know? it depends because when the bomb explodes, it, it disperses all yeah. sizes. Like Charles' father. You know? Right, he had shrapnel. When he went to his chest. And Charles had a coincidence too, which is yes. Charles, tell us about your coincidence. Uh, actually, in the 60s, my, uh, my sister lived in Seattle. So we took a trip to Seattle, my father and mother and I. And uh, in the service in World War II, my father had gotten shrapnel in Africa. Uh, in the 40s. And when we went to Seattle, my father had a heart attack and we had to rush him to the hospital. We get to the hospital and the doctor that examined him was the same doctor that sewed him up in, in the war. So they became friends and played golf. <laughs> yes. That's amazing. Why can't they remove uh, some shrapnel sometimes? Well, I think they do. Because well, it just depends on where it is. You know, but sometimes they can't remove it? Why? Well, if it it's close to a, if it's too close to an organ or too close to an artery, and it becomes too dangerous to take out. So. Like a bullet? Yeah. Okay. None of the wax will ever hurt. It only Oh, I must tell you this. When I crossed the Atlantic, the pilot of the, sh of the plane said, I'll be taking you girls all home. And I said, why? And he says, oh, you'll all be pregnant. I <laughs> 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 had some kind of an idea that we were going over there for the use of the soldiers. Um, I only saw one girl pregnant. She married Jerry Sauer, and she gave birth to twins. And I went to her wedding. Right. I never saw hanky panky. Right. I, what about wartime romances? I was very young, so I, I didn't know what a lesbian was. They talk, no, I didn't. They, they talk about a Lizzie. We had a Lizzie in our village. What's a Lizzie? You know, I, I thought of a Ford car, a Lizzie. Yeah. Right. But they were talking about a girl who was a lesbian. Right. 
But Mary, you did, you were aware of a lot of, of romances that, that happened, were, were you not? Well, we all had romances, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Including a lot of people who were, I mean, not you, of course, you weren't married, but I mean, some people were married, and, right, and they... No, only, out of all the wax, the 250 wax that were with, that I was in charge of, there were only two that were married. They were married to Air Force men, and boy, they put up some fuss when they were taken out of the third Air Force. No, I didn't see too much romance. Everybody dated, but uh, it wasn't like today. Today it's different. Right. You know, we were innocent. Yeah. We really were innocent, yeah. innocent people. Um, of course, you must have just become very close to the people who were sharing your care. It would be sort of hard maybe to relate to the people back home because your oh, life was I still safer. friends with every one of the girls as one by one died, and there's only delight, and I left. And where is she? She's in Minnesota, and she emails me. Yeah. I've gone through three husbands with her. Okay. But so your entire group of 13 kept, had reunions? No. And no, no. We dispersed, and one of, one of them is here. Right. Mary Lou was the other, and no. They're all dead. Right. But did you see each other again from time to time? Oh, yes. I visited Mary Lou in 1969. I went to Brownwood, Texas. What if Texas is a strange place? You know, you walk down the street in Texas and people have guns. They have holsters and guns. And, and jeeps would go by with uh, these bars that go across and it'd be a rifle. I mean, why would you ever see that in New York? I don't want Texas to be. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, you, you told me a story, I don't know if you want to tell, tell our guest, but about the OSS, about... Oh, yes. General Eisenhower, we had Marshall Patton and General Eisenhower. General Eisenhower was in our area, and he had a girlfriend. You probably all know Kay Summers, but she died here in South Carolina. Well, the Republican Party wanted to put her up, put him up for president, but they wanted to know a little bit more about him. So in my office, I had a telephone that didn't have any decibel drops. Do you understand Explain what that means? Well, well, I, I, when you pick up a telephone and there's somebody on the line, you can tell there's a drop. Well, my telephone didn't work like that. You could go in on any line back one night for eight hours. So somebody could not tell they were being listened to. Yes, oh. yes. Oh. And I had, um, I'll digress here for a moment. One night a general was calling England for some reason and couldn't get through, all the lines were busy. And he wanted to know why. So it was my job to tell him that, why the lines were busy. So I had to sit with my telephone and listen for eight hours. That was a disaster. They were. Men from the front, officers, not enlisted people, officers calling back to London, where am I, get my pinks ready. That was what they called their, I don't know why they call them pinks, because they were, what were they? They were officers' uniforms. Oh. They wanted them to be taken to the dry cleaners. Get my pinks ready, you know, they were calling their girlfriends, they were setting up dates, they were doing, and I had to write this down. I didn't like doing it, because you're like a traitor. And I'll tell you something, Within a week, those lines were clear. <laughs> <laughs> the generals could get through. Right. That, that's another thing. The French, the, our switchboards here, if you ever, any of you have ever been on a telephone uh, switchboard, when you check uh, a line a long distance to see whether it's busy, you go in the side of your key. So that's what I was used to. But when I got to France, there was a line of lights up ahead. So you could tell immediately whether the line was busy or not. I found that so fascinating. And we had a group from ITOT. Don't ask me what it stands for anymore. International Telephone and Delivery. They came in and they, they copied a lot of the stuff that the French switchboards had. No, no kidding. Yeah. They were advanced. And they told me that they were very advanced. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I was talking. So you were talking about the. You know, the office? Oh, yeah, I went to my office one day, and 
I couldn't get in. It was my office, and the door was locked. So I knocked on it, and the door opened about six inches, and I see a woman in a Class A uniform, no insignia. And what did that mean? I knew immediately it was intelligence. She had to be OSS. The CIA was formed in 1947. 1947. Prior to that, it was the Office of Strategic Supplies, the OSS. And in my office, when she, opened, when she saw who it was, that I worked there, I told her I worked there, she opened the door a little wider, and there were two or three men and several women, all in class A uniforms and no one's in there. And I found that strange, because when you're in the Army, you identify yourself. What? Yeah. Oh, I was, I was, I didn't want you to be touching your microphone, no, so it doesn't matter. Oh, I forgot about it. That's okay. You identify yourself and identify other people by what they're wearing, an officer or GI or, you know, staff sergeant. And I said, why are you in here? Well, you just take your little body out, I was told, and go sit out by the switchboard. So I did. I found out later, much later, that they were checking on Eisenhower. I think they wanted to know more about him, whether he was maybe worthy of running for president, because we all knew he was having an affair with her. In fact, he told General Marshall that he was going to get a divorce at the end of the year, and that was a rumor. And years later, I read about it in Elliot Roosevelt's book. He wrote that General Eisenhower had come to the White House and had told General Marshall he was going to get a divorce. But what happened, politics. When they were going to run him for president, they didn't want a divorce, so he had to stay married. Yeah. But he, right up to the end, he... Did he break off the... No. no. Did he break off? No. Did Mamie know about it? No. Oh, I'm sure she did. She had to know. She had to know. She, had to know. she wasn't a stupid woman. Yeah. And did you ever see Mamie Eisenhower? I mean, I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Well, this girl was tall, blonde, blue-eyed, and gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> she was his driver. Yeah. <laughs> Which reminds me, I was put in for the Bronze Star. Yeah. I was put in for the Bronze Star, but General Eisenhower passed an edict that said no enlisted people could get that, had to be an officer. But it wasn't too long before he put K and she got the bronze star. And she was enlisted. That changed. Yeah. That changed. But the French government gave me a, a quart of gear. Isn't that amazing? For the star. Hold it, hold it, it's real still for a second. And I was very proud of that because I was in charge of these French people whom I adored. And, you know, I felt I was very important. Oh, my ego was, you know. And when I left Paris, a Russian woman came in. She must have been, she was old. She must have been about 32. <laughs> uh, spoke five languages. She spoke Russian, English, French, German, and Italian. Fluent in English. She came in and, she, and I thought, how am I ever going? It's going to take me weeks to tell this woman what I do. It took me like four hours. Oh, wow. Smart. Oh, my ego went like this. <laughs> I realized then that you're all... Yeah, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Mary, did you uh, make friends, not just your friends in the WAX, but people in England or France oh, that yes. you kept in touch with? Oh, you? yes. Oh, yes. Um, in fact, one of the French girls, I used to go to parties with her. She was a dentist. And for some reason, she liked me. She was a little older than I, but she liked me. And she hated Americans, GIs. She said, what right do they have to hold up a bar of candy and say, bully vous coucher avec moi, c'est moi. <laughs> <laughs> she said, for a bar of candy. <laughs> she didn't like that. And she felt that, and you know, in France, sex is um, very open. They had girls there who had these beautiful white coats and red pocketbooks, and I love them, and I wanted to get one. Mm -hmm. And I found out that they were prostitutes, and it's quite legal there. They're inspected and, and accepted. That's, that's the word I was looking for. They're accepted. And 
I just thought their outfits were great. <laughs> but I bet you didn't buy one, did you? Mary? No, I wasn't able to get them. <laughs> Gary, <laughs> speaking of outfits, explain this picture here. Can you see? Oh, some of you will have to look a little later, I think. But she's in her slip. Also, yeah. When the girls fraternized with the German army, when the Germans left Paris, they shaved the heads of the girls, and they took their pictures. And I was walking down off the Shans on the one day, and I saw a group of these girls, same girls, because this was going on all over Paris, but these girls were very, very pregnant. They were very pregnant. And they were, their heads were all shaved, and they were in slips. <coughs> the French, I think, I think they were embarrassed. They were embarrassed. And so they had a sort of a public humiliation. They had to have, they had to do this. Because what was wrong with, with a girl fraternized with a German man? Maybe she got food. Maybe she got, you know, sustenance some way or other. Oh, well. <laughs> Mary, the, the picture, okay, the picture on, on the top. You're on the right. Can you notice that Mary on the right and Robert right. on the left? And that was in Paris. So you went out at night sometimes, right? Oh, constantly. <laughs> oh, yeah. The Red Cross, God bless the Red Cross. God bless the Red Cross. They had a place in Paris, well, not only in Paris, but I think I mentioned in Normandy, they brought us coffee and hot, hot coffee and donuts, which we hadn't seen. But when I was in Paris, they had a beautiful building called Rainbow Corner. And I like classical music, I prefer it. And Mary Lou liked classical music. And since we don't drink, we didn't drink anything at the time except champagne. <laughs> Boy, we love champagne. We used to go there any night and we didn't have a date. And this night we were there and there were two GIs there in fatigues, no insignia. We didn't pay any attention. The next night we went there, same thing. This went on for several nights. And finally, one of the men came, they were young, I would say early 30s. They came up to us and asked us if we'd like to go for a ride in a six by six. Well, of course we would. So Mary Lou and I and the two GIs get in this truck. We all sat there in the front. And we drove around Paris for hours. We went to depot after depot after depot, railroad depots. Didn't know why, what these men were doing, but they both leave and they disappear for an hour. Come back and we go to another depot. We try to get the information from them. They said, well, they had, that's what they did at night. We had business there. About three weeks later, they came to Rainbow Corner and asked us if we'd like to go to a bar. They were in Class A uniforms without insignia. They were in the OSS. They arrested a captain, American captain. American sergeant, and I don't know how many GIs. They had been, I forget the word for it. You know, I'm having a senior moment. What's the word for it when you steal a carload? Hijack. 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 Hijacks. They were hijacking, not a truck, but a, a railroad car. A railroad car. At the railroad car. And selling it on the black market. And we were their shills. I guess that's what you call us. <laughs> when we went into the depot, the guards let us through because they figured these two guys are shacking up with these two girls. Oh. And they let us through. They weren't worried about us being uh, cops or robbers or anything like that. But I was always very proud of that. Here it was in the Stars and Stripes, the, the arrest. So they took us to this bar, and we were introduced to all these people. And oh, there were men there and women. And they made a big deal out of Mary Lou and oh, myself. <laughs> Plied us with champagne. We smoked in those days, too. We didn't know that it was bad for you, and I gave it up years later. But I'll never forget that night. We were so proud. Here we were really big shots. Right. You know, they were, because we were their little shills. 
So that was my two experiences with the OSS. And the funny thing about it is my daughter's married, my daughter's, my son-in-law's father was in the OSS, but in the CBI, the uh, China, Burma, Indian. That's what his role was. And one day I happened to mention something about the OSS, and Mark says, talk to Dad about it. He was in a, uh, yeah. amazing Mary. Um, let's see if we want to take a look at Well, let me tell you about that picture. This one down here? Yeah, this one. Okay. Uh, in France, I, should I, think, later. I think I told you that uh, in France, sex and going to the bathroom is very open. Oh, this picture. Yes. And in France, they have these round, circular buildings. I don't know whether they're still there. But they're, so. they're called pissoirs. Yes, they're called pissoirs. Exactly. <laughs> and one day, I was going down the street with this, um, a Belgian boy. And he excused himself. He said, I'm going to go in here. And I didn't know what it was, because I had just gotten to Paris. And it was a pissoir. And he went in to urinate, came out, and his face, I said, what's the matter? He said a French woman came in with a long handled brush and proceeded to scrub the wall alongside of him while he's urinating. <laughs> they thought nothing of it. And of course, being very provincial from coming from Yonkers, it was a different, right. different, right. different world. Mary, this whole experience must have just changed your life incredibly, right? You just, you probably weren't the same person afterwards, were you? I, I, don't, I don't think it ever changed me because I think it was the second day I was in Paris, we met a couple of GIs, and they asked us if we wanted to go to a bar. Sure, we ought to refuse that. Champagne? We'll go into the bar, and it was a floor show. Naked women. Absolutely stark naked women, powdered from head to foot. They had powder all over them. And that was unusual for you. You haven't seen anything I like that. I've never seen anything like that. I heard, I heard about it was six. Right. And one time I went to the Bell Tavern. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Paris and been there. It's a very famous nightclub. And they have all these naked women, you know, cavorting around. We went downstairs. I was with a black officer that night and a, the sergeant I was dating at the time and his captain. We all excused ourselves and went to the ladies' room. And while we're washing our hands, there's a wall. And there's Frank Harris, the captain, and Sergeant Kleinsworth <laughs> urinating the other side of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and where I worked, where I worked, in our little latrine, it was our office, there was a wall and an open space. And the Frenchmen used to come there and watch. And, and there we'd be going to the bathroom. But they wasn't interested in us. They were looking for our cigarettes. They put out little <laughs> tins of um, the end of the of a can right. so we could put our butts in it and then they could strip it and take oh, it. Wow. the tobacco out. Yeah. Even then it was addictive, right? But they have such a different outlook on things like that. Mm -hmm. Like having a peace war on the street. Yeah. <laughs> They don't have have you been back to they don't have them anymore? No, we took them away about twenty years ago because I used to live in Paris. Oh. They're no longer there, but they were interesting. So. Yes, it is. Well, I'll never forget. I'll never forget his face. That woman brushing the wall. Mary, have you been back to Paris yeah. or London? Malcolm Terry went to London. Oh God, I love that man. Yeah. He was my boss for 19 years. Wonderful. He went back to London. I I told him exactly where to go. And he went to the bar where I used to get a glass of mild and bitter. That's mild English beer and bitter beer. Mm -hmm. But you did, I never drank mild and I never drank bitter. I, in fact, I didn't drink. I wasn't a drinker. And I'd get a glass, because you had to buy something. Right. Right? I'd get a glass of mild and bitter mixed. Mm -hmm. And then everybody started, that sort of started a trail there with the mm -hmm. Americans. And he brought back the, um, the name of it was the Dover Castle. Mm -hmm. And he brought back the, um, the menu and a picture of it on and her signature. Of course, she didn't remember me, you know. Yeah. Mary, what was it like for you to come back here uh, after you were discharged? I was, I couldn't settle down. Um, 
with my brother and his wife, his father, and his wife were going to Florida. And I went with him. Mm -hmm. And I, we were going for two weeks and I stayed six months. Okay. And even then I didn't want to go home, but his mother got homesick. Mm -hmm. And she, they came home, so we could walk them home. But I settled down, I, I got a job. Mm -hmm. and, but were the thoughts of what you've been through with you a lot? I don't dwell on it, I don't think. Uh, only these last few mi no. weeks. No, yeah, right. I was yeah. coming here. But one thing I remember, I got a job at Lawrence Barron's. It was a jam and jelly factory. I was in the office. And I left when I saw the label. Because in Normandy, only eight out of doors on these big tables. One of the things the army had was a lot of jam and a lot of jelly and a lot of bees. Oh, we have bees because they have apple orchards there and they make calvados. So we didn't want to get stung by these bees, although I don't think now looking back the bees would ever have bothered us. They were looking for apple blossoms. But we took the jam and jelly and we piled it high on bread and put it out for it, and the place would be black with bees. And we could eat in peace. Uh, and it was Lawrence Barron. It's the oh, place no. I worked okay. for in the office. Isn't that true? And I, I found, yes. Oh, this has been very, very interesting, and I appreciate it very much. You were in the midst of a war, and you know, lots of people were getting killed all the time. You weren't directly related to that. But was that a burden to live with, or how did you deal with that whole thing? Well, the office that I worked at, I was really in charge of many people. And I was an enlisted person. I couldn't go home to be a warrant officer, because that was the next grade. I wouldn't leave Paris. But things passed my desk that were not pleasant. Mel Gibson be damned. I saw the pictures of the camps. And they were delivered to me by an MP in a gun. And I had a sign for them. And there were pictures like this. There were pictures from the Signal Corps of the camps, Belson and Dashaw and others. They were terrible pictures. I'm sorry. That's the one thing about the war. I knew it was happening to the Jews. That's what, one of the reasons why I wanted to go in the army. But that was the worst. I didn't keep those pictures. I couldn't. I guess there were other people who probably came into more daily contact with, with, with casualties, immediate casualties from the war. Like, I know my parents were both, you know, with the hospital unit, so they were, but in your, among your acquaintances and friends, were there many people who were, who were no. killed? No. no. The only one was uh, Jim Minette, the Australian guy, right. sort of was killed on right. Acres of Elvis. They used to say, the, Planes came in on the wing of the prayer. Well, that's what happened. Yeah. Right? When he got home to England, the plane exploded in the air. Right. I never knew what happened to him because my letter was returned. But my brother went to Somerset House and found out what happened. What happened to him? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mary, I just think that we are so lucky to have a person like you who did what you did and who really were don't, willing to... Don't misunderstand me. I enjoy the no, no, I, I know you do. We, we, we've got do. a good sense of that. But also, you know, the appreciation that we feel that you were among those who were just ready to give everything and do whatever was needed. There were, there were 250 to others. Right. Yeah. There were. I, I have here three telephone directories. This is what I did when I was first landed in, in Paris. At 
The first night I was there at Milano in the office, I typed up a one sheet directory of all the people that we knew and their telephone numbers. And then it was two pages, and then it was, and then finally it became books. And I thought that if any of you people here had relatives in a war in London, what we call the Towser, that was the European Theater of Operations, USA. If any of you, because my brother's name is like mm -hmm. found years later. Right. I never thought my brother was in it. And there, there, there I see not Bob Norton where he was. You might want to look. I looked up Dr. Wright, and I looked up your mother's name, Ellis, but I there couldn't find either one. Right. So, um, well, I think maybe we can keep these. So you know, know everybody up here, here and look, those look, of you who want to come up and take it out, find them because that would be great. And, and this, I'm oh, sorry. And this was um, Paris was liberated, believe it or not, by the FFV. That was the French. Oh, you know that. Yeah, the FFE. And three days later, the Americans came in. And the fourth day, I came in. And so I was out walking one day. I was out walking one day, and right around the, off the tram, or you've been to Paris, people, you know how huge, it's huge. It would take up half, maybe a south end, it seems to me. And there were seven avenues. Or eight, maybe eight. No, eight, going out. The Champs Elysees was the main one. And this day, there's French tanks all around. There must have been a thousand tanks. Well, a lot of them. And I was out walking, I like to walk, I still do. And I was out walking this day, and there were all these French tanks, and no, nobody in them. And then almost like a signal. The turrets opened up and somebody stood up. And then and then somebody else stood up. And I just I was enthralled because there was, you know, kind of history. And you never hear too much about that. But I latched on to that picture. Right. We, we actually Mary has a few more pictures too that are in another envelope that we can show. I think we're going to end the, the public part of this and I think Mary will be happy to stick around and answer questions and show you what she's brought here. But I want to end this, Mary, by kind of telling you how much we appreciate your sharing your memories with pleasure. us. It was just a, a really a wonderful honor to have you here, Mary. Thank you very much.